from what I've reviewed, it appears that political misinformation really only seems to exist on the right. And that becomes a serious problem because if you don't have a quality in that data set of what the very definition of misinformation uh, means, you can really change speech on a global scale without people actually ever even realizing it. Jack mentions labeling or sensitive content in his testimony. There's a difference between the public facing labels that people see for election content and the type of labeling that I've reviewed or data labeling. And I think that that's one way that Twitter was able to get away with the narrative around some of this because they publicly only talked about that front end labeling. Right, they right. never really talk about the back end labeling. This is not a story that is just about Twitter. Twitter is an example of something that's systemic and much larger. One thing that I found really fascinating over and over and over again, when I kept saying, where do these words come from? Who gave you these words for this data set? And it wasn't the person. When people keep saying, oh, Twitter employees went rogue, they didn't go rogue. The person that I spoke with wasn't going rogue. They're doing what they were told that aligned with their mission. So they're not necessarily seeing anything wrong with what they're doing because it is what they believe in. The answer to the question was the CDC, trust and safety, government agencies, and academic researchers. But academic researchers was what I heard over and over and over again. And I thought, huh, that's kind of interesting. And that was a whole other rabbit hole to go down of what that really looked like. Without naming them, I'll say there's some of the academic researchers who are funded by the government who focus on, quote unquote, social media disinformation. And by the way, some of those same academic researchers are now involved with the report that OpenAI just put out recently. And they sort of go from sector to sector, from company to company, and they make these recommendations, but they're not really just recommendations because the data scientists are looking at that and saying they're the trusted expert. They have domain expertise, so I'm going to do what they say because this must be right. There's no one in the middle of that process that's saying, wait, is this right? Is this actually misinformation? And that's how all of this is in a cyclical effect. Happen there is systemic of a larger issue. And the fact that I'm seeing these same academic researchers now move over to OpenAI and do the same thing after looking at their policy recommendations, I could see the similarities of what they're saying are recommendations and them actually being hard-coded on the back end with the data that I looked at. That to me is the scariest part of this. So this is not just about any one company. This is about an overall institutional level of corruption at the highest level in academia, where a lot of these people are put on such a pedestal. They're funded by the government to do this research. By the way, Biden just funded more research in this area. And so they are fueling it. Our government is actually fueling this. So is that Twitter's fault? No. If someone wants to take responsibility, it probably has to start at the government level. They're the ones funding it. And right. that's not a conversation anyone really wants to have. So for example, various, you see election integrity. This is concerning to me. So this tells me that the mere discussion of election integrity is being flagged. Why? Mm -hmm. Like, why can't we question the process of election integrity? What happened to America where we can't even have that conversation? Mm -hmm. That has to be flagged in the background. Also, this set here for government agency, where it's almost every single U.S. government agency uh, is flagged in here. Do you mean if someone brings up that government agency yes. in the context of a tweet or in a conversation? In the context of a tweet. Here I see ICE, you see, CIS, you see DHS, you see so many of them and FBI over and over and over again. And so here's one. Challenge, prove, government agency, FBI, issue, interfere, fraud, break, disinfo. Laptop, machine, laptop. So <laughs> it's it Hunter to be Biden like, right there. <laughs> so, the so org, FBI. All of those terms, as you read them in a string, are you saying that the combination of any of those terms would set off alarm bells, or is it just like a Correct. set of terms that this particular person wants the AI to keep an eye out for? Combination. Is it a combination. This, this this is what made this work so hard to do, because this is not a banned word list. These are terms that they kept saying, well, in context, we saw this as misinformation. And if you used X number of terms that we viewed, then we gave you a score. And then if you're at 290, then we would review it. It would be reviewed by us or it would be reviewed by the algorithm. And so sometimes you would just get bounced back and forth between machine learning review, which I thought was really interesting. I don't think people 
perhaps realize that humans are not as involved. All of this is going on in the background. One of the things that they said, which is fascinating, is that none of these tweets are reported. That's important for people to understand the context here. If you're talking about the FBI and disinfo and laptop and gov and all of these words, no one has to report that speech is being problematic. It's already reported without anyone reporting it. Wow. That's that very its- Orwellian. I think that's the story and also yeah. issue disinfo so to be clear the disinfo researchers recommended that they plug in for nlp the mere mention of disinfo <laughs> should be flagged this is what i'm saying the same thing with election fraud integrity like that's concerning to me that's bipartisan that's basically saying we've lost the right to even discuss it, it, what's going on in this country and What's more concerning is I don't think people realize it. I genuinely feel that with access to the missing piece of this puzzle, this could be historical. We are at Watergate levels of NLP and how this was used around the election. To not give out those files, I have a very hard time believing that someone is truly about free speech when they're gating access to the files that show how speech was dismantled. To show that line of evidence, you need to have screenshots of those emails, which actually shows, okay, here's what this academic researcher who's funded by the Biden administration said to XYZ, a trust and safety on this date. But instead, they're investigating the person who's the head of trust and safety. They're not really looking at the people who are responsible for the quote unquote responsible AI and machine learning uh, division at Twitter, which is almost incredible to me. It's incredible that anyone would have a hearing on social media censorship and not bring those people into this conversation. It shows a complete lack of technical awareness of how the majority of this is being done. I also think it's embarrassing that the elected officials seem to be more concerned with how their personal Twitter accounts were treated or suspended rather than the constituents who they were elected to represent. And so that's the difference here. I call them the Dem files because that's what I think about them. I think that they are elitist. I think they don't really show the story of what happened to the average American who's not an influencer, who may have had just a few hundred followers. And every time they keep getting answers about their account, that is not a valid answer about how regular accounts were censored, which is what this data shows. And I think that hurts the collective public understanding of how natural language processing can be used to modify language at scale. If this is about free speech, we need those documents to show how speech was dismantled. Without that, I think that we're really doing a grave disservice to what free speech really means. It's much more than what those Twitter files were. It's much worse than anything there. This is a case study. We have a rare opportunity, if Elon will actually give us that opportunity, to release the specific files that I need to share this full story. And then you can take that somewhere. Then you have a case. This other stuff that they're throwing around is not substantial enough for evidence to show the end-to-end story of how it starts with the email, who it goes to, how it goes to the academic researcher that was funded by the government, and then it goes to trust and safety, then it gets programmed by a contractor who works in data science. I can show you the second half of that story. Elon has to participate to be able to show the first half of that story, but we don't have that because we have disjointed reporters working on this story, none of who speak to each other. By the way, I offered to give all my files to one of those reporters. They never responded earlier. You said, why would they be leaving out the story or why are they not asking for it? And my answer, in all honesty, is because I don't think they know what to ask for. They don't know. They're not machine learning experts. They're focused on a very specific political narrative. And earlier in the show, you said, wasn't this so surprising? No, I don't believe anything that was revealed was surprising. And I also think it paints somewhat of a negative picture of... um, law enforcement and federal agents. And I want to be clear about that because if Twitter was truly doing their job with CSE, of course, there's probably some emails or if CSE actually or sex trafficking or any of that was actually handled the way it should have been, which of course we don't have any evidence of that at all. But if it was, there would be emails with the FBI, law enforcement or whatever agency was involved. Are we saying that we shouldn't have those emails? So it paints this picture that any interaction between big tech and a federal agency is bad. And that's simply not true. There's nuance in all of this. There's nuance in my reporting, which I've tried to share. This is a tech story. It should have been tech first, then politics. Here's the thing. If anyone bothered to do their job and actually look at the tech, which is what I did, they would get what they wanted about the politics. But because they chose 
to go after the politics, they miss the tech and they miss the story. That is it. There's no other way to say it. And as far as I'm concerned, it is, it's a disgrace. I'm sorry, it is. Because this is the greatest story of our lifetime. This could change history. And to have access to that level of information on a company and to use this for political talking points and to get Substack subscribers, when you have an entire nation that's about to possibly go under with AI being weaponized at scale against us, you could have done something. You could have had a role in changing that. And you didn't. 99% of these takedowns are done with machine mm. learning. And so this is why when people are like, oh, Elon, you have a rogue employee. No, he doesn't have a rogue employee. He, what he has is total lack of control over his models. Why does he have that? Because contractors were used all over the world to do some of the most critical functions in ML for Twitter. There was not this nice, friendly handoff. You know, thousands of contractors were fired. How that knowledge is transferred from one person to the next in acquisition is extremely important. And when it isn't handled right, you lose all that institutional knowledge. And I think that's part of what's gone on here. If I were him, it's certainly much easier to start over from scratch and to just be honest and transparent and say, listen, like we need to start over. I need to start over because what he's always going to be playing whack-a-mole with this system that he's inherited. And I believe he probably has a much better chance of making something that he wants to make is if he's making it from scratch, because it's going to be his and he's yeah. not going to be fixing someone else's problems. So I think the tool is really a byproduct of the people that create the tools. And so that's the point of distinction that I think is so important to get across that not all AI is bad and not all AI is dangerous, but AI used in the wrong hands by the wrong people and for the wrong purposes can be incredibly dangerous. And that's part of the reason why I'm talking about this or trying to open up the national conversation is because we really need more talent to win the AI war right now in America. Uh, we stand to lose everything on a global scale if we don't step it up. China has far surpassed us already in terms of what they're doing with AI. And a perfect example of that is if you look at the data that I've shared, I mean, look at how the top big tech companies in America are using AI against their own citizens for much different reasons. And that is really concerning. I had several outside data scientists review the data that I shared. One thing that was really interesting is that person stated that they came to America to flee from China and they came back here only to find a lot of the same tactics being used mm -hmm. against citizens. And so when they looked at that data, they thought that it was extremely similar to exactly the types of stuff that they saw in China. And they also said the way that people get around that in China is that they start using other words as a form of language to avoid right. this.